and good evening wherever you are joining us from. Uh, if you can hear me, could you please say yes so that I know that everyone can hear me? Right, great. So, just an introduction. Uh, first, welcome, bienvenue uh, to today's webinar because I know people are joining from francophone countries as um, also from anglophone countries. So we are today focusing on youth engagement and climate change adaptation uh, with an emphasis on national adaptation plans. Um, I'm Vasita Vijayanayaka, I'm the Executive Director of Cycling Trust. Some of you may know me from work or the webinars we've been doing previously. And today we have three great speakers, um, people I've had the privilege of working with from three countries, developing countries, uh, Niger, Ghana, and Sri Lanka. So um, before we go ahead, um, I'll just give a brief profile so you can have a look at who you'll be hearing from today. So we have Sunny, uh, and then we've got Chibizi and Sajani speaking from Niger, Ghana, and Sri Lanka. And they'll give a brief introduction to themselves before they present as well. So I'm not going to go too much into detail, but just saying that they're, they're doing great work and we are glad to have them on today's call. And to start off, the uh, participants or the speakers today have worked on some level uh, in the national adaptation plans process uh, and climate change adaptation in countries, especially in the decision-making processes and implementing activities with youth, as well as other stakeholders. Uh, on national adaptation plans, um, where does the youth involvement come in? National adaptation plans are, um, um, created as a multi-stakeholder driven process and also a country driven process. So youth play a key role as a key uh, stakeholder and this should be emphasized a lot in making our national adaptation plans and how we implement it. So that's how we, that's what we're going to discuss today. The challenges we face, uh, the lessons learned um, and more information on national adaptation plans if you would like to receive, please drop us an email and we share with you. So I'm not going to take uh, a lot of your time. Uh, now I will move to Sunny um, and he will take over from here. Sunny, it's your time to speak. Okay, uh, morning. Morning, uh, thank you Vosita for the introduction. So uh, I'm going to present uh, the youth engagement in climate change adaptation in Niger. So I will uh, just start and have uh, like uh, a plan with uh, the presentation of uh, my, uh, the organization that I'm working with, uh, my background, and also uh, present my country to uh, people also. And then I will present uh, how youth engagement on climate change are going in Niger. So. Uh, so talking about uh, myself, I'm the co-founder and executive director of YVE in Niger. YVE, the Young Volunteer for Environment. It's a local organization, but that's a member of the international movement called uh, Jeune Volontaire pour l'Environnement. That was created uh, in 2001 uh, in Togo. Uh, it's also in West Africa. So I'm also an activist on climate change negotiation and. Uh, and follow that of uh, environmental policies. I have more than 10 years experiences working with young people. I was in my country, uh, a former of the National Youth Council. Charlie was elected also as a member of the chief, chief commissioner of the Scout Movement in Niger. So as you know, Scout is among the largest youth movement in the world. And here in Niger also, we have like a Scout Association that I'm leading for the next uh, two years. For my background, I have two master's degree, one in project management and another one in communication. I have several certificates in, uh, in terms of environmental field. So the recent one is uh, the BERT Leadership Environmental Program for the University of California in Berkeley. So for the organization, YV is a youth organization that was created here in Niger in 2009. And we have uh, a, uh, our office is based here in Yemen. And we are part of the AIC, AIC, the African Youth uh, Movement on Climate Change, African Youth Initiative on Climate Change. And also part of this network, we are a member of uh, the National Platform of Civil Society Organization on Climate Change and Sustainable Development in Niger. So uh, that's about the presentation. Uh, 
our main mission as a YV is uh, the eco citizenship, the leadership uh, development, thriving by the communities. And the vision that we have a long time is the youth led community development because our organization is also a community based one because we have like, several local branches in, uh, in the country. Okay, so to talk about the country, welcome to Niger. Niger is part of the West Africa. West Africa and, uh, is among the large country uh, in this area, more than uh, 1 million, 2,077 kilometers. And the population is under uh, more than 21 million in 2018. So maybe uh, this year, if uh, we have to count, we are around maybe 22 million people in Niger. And the importance to know that the most communities are rural and are extremely dependent on natural resources, such as the pastoral communities. And uh, when you come here in Niger, you can see like more than 70% of the community that are living in rural area. And if I have to talk about the young people in Niger, uh, we represent the vast majority of the population as well, more than uh, 77% and the rapid population growth create a high demand of, for public investment in health and education and raise the issue of the place and all the young people in Niger society. So we have several initiatives that try to gather young people. Uh, but when we talk about also the climate hazard in Niger, we have floods. Every year we have the river that's called the, the country named Niger is also the name of the river. This is among also the largest river that uh, we share with uh, three other countries. So we have floods every year, and that's uh, allow people, we have uh, the displacement, loss of production, prosperity, prosperity. And we have also as Sahel, because the Sahel is this area that we have uh, some recurrent drought with all its form. So that's come uh, the chronic of food insecurity since like uh, the 10 years back, every year we have like the food insecurity. We have the migratory bears, we have crops and animal production uh, loses and pests. So that's among the weakness. Uh, and also, uh, when we talk about the precipitation, is uh, sometimes they are strong, sometimes they are weak. So all those ones have the impact in terms of degradation, the water erosion, the depletion of land and lower agriculture yield. Because our main economy is based on agriculture, and this one is based also on the raining season. So sometime uh, in those past year, we are facing to, uh, those weeks of precipitation. And actually we have the increase of the temperature. When, when you look at careful, actually it's like uh, yesterday it was uh, at, uh, 42, before yesterday is like uh, more than 45 degrees. So it's uh, very high. So that is a kind of environment that can allow uh, some diseases like malaria, meningitis, or other diseases to attack people. That's among the presentation of the country. So uh, when it's come to talk about the climate change and the adaptation in Niger, as sure as part of the Sahel area, we are uh, most vulnerable uh, uh, in terms of uh, climate change impact and the agriculture, the livestock, forestry, water resources, wildlife, fishing, health and wetland are among the main sector that are very impacted uh, by the climate change. According to the national, the NAPA, the National Adaptation Program that was uh, uh, elaborated in uh, 2006. So when you talk about uh, adaptation is very crucial for our producer, because as I already told you, uh, the main economic are uh, based on agriculture, livestock, all those things. So if those ones are very uh, impacted by the climate change, so it's crucial for people to see how uh, they can adapt, which kind of knowledge, how people do, because like since uh, 19, uh, 1974, we were faced to several droughts, several environmental issues, and people have developed some capacity to be faced. But according to now, the, after the, uh, the UN, uh, uh, the Earth Summit, Niger was part of the, all the three conventions post-EU. And actually, uh, the government and the authority 
cities has developed several policies and strategies that try to develop uh, and program adaptation such as the NAPA, the NDC. We have our NDC that is, uh, we are in the process to review it. We have also the National Climate Change Policy and several other policies that can help the government and all uh, the intervention for the development to take in consideration this issue. But the fact is that uh, in all these policies, the young people uh, are uh, seen as uh, it's uh, of all the intervention because also they see them, uh, the program consider them or this policy consider a job seeker or job, job provider. So that's why when you look at all those kind of document, the policies, uh, they develop for young perspective, they develop the youth entrepreneurship uh, because for them it's like a kind of attention, the point of attention for them to see if they want to involve young people, they have to develop several initiatives in terms of green business, green entrepreneurship. However, few young people or young sector are involved in the formulation of these policies or in their implementation because as our organization, Young Volunteer for Environment, was created in 2009, it's not every in all the kind of policies or document or strategy that you we see young people are involved as young people. But it's just sometimes when uh, they have some project that they want to be implemented, that must be implemented, they try to involve young people just as beneficiary. So for us, it's like... Uh, a kind of attention to see that young people must play a key role, not only as beneficiary, but as part of the solution, as part of, of the process. So in Niger also, we have several initiatives for adaptation. We have the 14 that was created or elaborated in terms of the government document, like the promotion of livestock food bank, the water control, the production, the dissemination of agrometeorological information, so we have several programs like this that are part of the solution for the Niger to adapt the system in terms of climate change. Maybe I'll be back to this uh, those initiatives, but uh, let's continue to see the, the NAP process in Niger. Actually, we are in the process uh, uh, to elaborate uh, the NAP, the, the National Adaptation Plan. It was established, uh, as you know, in the Cancun framework in 2010. And the Niger starts uh, continuously, gradually, and interactively to have his own one. So uh, thank God the last year, I think we start uh, the process. And in terms of institutional arrangement, we have like the institution called uh, 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 the National Environment Council for Sustainable Development. This one is uh, created under the Prime Minister officer. It's like a kind of stakeholder uh, a group that you have the private sector, the government, the multilateral bank, all the stakeholders that join, and also the civil society. So it's this one that uh, that is also uh, this institution is the focal point of all the three uh, convention posterior is the one that lead this process here in Niger. So the government uh, try to develop several formulations. And, but the main issue is when, when you look at the process when they started, uh, they, they call a CSO organization, women organization, but they never call or try to involve young people as, as part of, of, of this those process. Actually, they have several studies that are going, but they can say that as young people are not involved or not, they didn't call us to join or to tell our, our part, our point of view about this uh, national adaptation plan. So this is among uh, the week for me that maybe we can see together how we can advocate uh, in order to put, uh, to let young people play their role. Uh, so the youth, when you when it's come to talk about youth engagement, the prison method uh, used at national level for engagement, climate change, and decision making process. For us, our uh, because we have like uh, more than ten years experience working with young people. The first thing that we do is we try to mobilize young people uh, through our several network for action. So every year we try to see the youth movement, the youth organization here in Niger. And as I say, we have also here the National Youth Council that try to lead to create synergies between all the youth organizations depending on their topic because you have some organization that trying to deal with health issue or education or environmental issues so we have like specific network 
based on uh, uh, each topic. We have also some uh, CBO, the community-based organization that play, that play a role in terms of implementation and awareness campaign. This is our, like the local one when you go to the village or when to go to some county, you can have like uh, those small organizations that try also to be part of the solution and play uh, a role. And also we have like a kind of advocacy program that try we have some campaigns, some petition, if you want to raise concern about some specific topic. We have like a program also, the method, one of the method is like a training throughout workshops, seminars, short consultation. We try to involve young people to help them to have the best knowledge or to have the right information about some issues. So actually, the national process of uh, the Southern Voices also that uh, we were engaged last year as part of the national platform for CSO on sustainable development and climate change. So we were considered as part of the process and we try to, to identify the NAP entry point. This is a kind of study that we, we did uh, together with Sri Lankan and uh, with the help of Care International in terms of Southern Voices. And this is part of this kind of initiative that also gives the voice to young people uh, to listen to them and also take in consideration their point of view. So when you, when it comes to talk about the gaps and challenges, the first thing for me is uh, taking young people into account in climate change policies and strategies. Actually, all the policies that we have, young people are beneficiary for those ones. So I think it's, very, it's good to take in consideration young people. We have to try to see how we can deal with this one. And it's when it comes also to the funding of youth organization. They're like uh, young P uh, P youth organization have this problem for instability of staff. Uh, it's not, uh, we are always looking for long-term project funding, but the partner or the donor just, sometimes they give like small grant for young organization because for them it's a youth organization. They don't need like a three years program or an activity for a year. They just try to help young people organization for, youth organization for just a project for a month or three months or six months. So for me, this is a challenge also. It, there is also a low capacity of young people on environmental issues. Because for some young people, it is like a, a specific topic that you have to make some studies. So I think it's a low capacity for young people on environmental issues. So there is a limited access to climate information also. Uh, because here, uh, some document, uh, you can find them online, but when, when you go through it online, they are not updated. When you go to the institution that produces or give those, those uh, data or those information, climate, uh, they, they require several authorization or several document approval because, before giving those information to young people. So this is a kind of challenge also. And also documentation, capitalism, or research data. So this is among... Uh, and uh, for me also, how can we have like uh, scaling up uh, the good practices because several young organization, youth organization have like have experiences, know how to deal with uh, communities, how to deal with some issues, but there is a need to scale up uh, the good practices. When it comes to the production, dissemination of knowledge and make it available to other actors operating in the same sector also because it's good to see that we, we are uh, doing activities on agriculture, maybe other are doing for life skills or fishery. So it's good to see how we can uh, put all those uh, together and make it available to the other actors. The climate information, a language adapted and understood by young people, because sometimes you have like data or the information coming for scientist site is not only, uh, always uh, easy for some young people or youth organization to understand this kind of language. So I think it's a, a challenge or a gap to see how we can adapt, how we can help young people to more understand the challenges or the information when it comes to the report, to the IPCC, all those documents must be adapted. The government reference also, it, it's like a kind of a challenge that a young organization have to deal sometime in terms of transparency accountability and dependency. So uh, for me, it's very important to see young people or uh, youth organization can uh, uh, do their work uh, in the transparency uh, manner or the way to be more uh, accountability. 
and youth are not mentioned in the NAP readiness proposal and do not seem to have a lot of focus on their engagement. This is when you see actually I already told when I talk about the NAP process, actually youth people uh, didn't have like a specific mandate or seem to be part of the process. So this is a in terms of challenge, a way that we can see also how we can do it. The importance also to include youth as a key stakeholder in the NAP process and in the preparation of the NAP roadmap. This is something important for me. I think it's it's uh, very important because we are in the process, so it's not too late to see how they can involve young people as key stakeholders. When I have to uh, talk about uh, the approaches and the lesson learned, uh, I think our innovative strategy is based on the networking, the partnership, because actually we are part of several network. We have some coalitions, some movement that allow us also to show our strength. We have them some alliances with the parliamentarian, with the university, the research institute. With them, we try to work closely and uh, to benefit uh, with, uh, with their, their knowledge. We have like also advocacy and the lobby, our politics of transparency and anti-corruption, uh, we try to see how we can use also a lot of media and social media as youth organization. We know that youth are the main user of social media. So we try to base our own activities or our uh, sharing our strategies on social media. And uh, all our activities, the men are based on volunteerism and uh, the coordination with other organizations. That's our, our approach is to see how we can, uh, as you see on the picture, several kind of meeting uh, with the communities, with uh, young people or students or children. So to summarize, uh, I think it's very important to see that the youth engagement uh, in terms of opportunity here, we have like uh, the NAP development process that is ongoing. And also we have like this facility of uh, the NDC partnership that Niger, the countries are allowed to review. So we can have like uh, Niger will receive some funds to review the NDC. I think it's an opportunity for young people to be more involved, uh, to be more here in this process. And also we have like, as we are in the Sahel region, we have the implementation of the PIC RS. The PIC is the investment, the climate investment plan for the Sahel region. That was uh, launched last year here in Niger with uh, like uh, all the Sahel countries are uh, uh, trying to see how they can make effort together. And they want to mobilize like more than 400 uh, million of dollars uh, for the implementation of the, this climate investment plan in the Sahel area. So I think it's a kind of opportunities also uh, that young people must use or uh, to be part of all those process. I think we have also to introduce or to educate more young people to the climate negotiation process because uh, myself, I have this experience to participate in more than uh, five, uh, five uh, conferences of party. But I think it's really a need for young people to understand what's going on, to understand which kind of role they can play, how they can prepare themselves uh, before going or doing this kind of uh, conference, the UN conference on negotiation. But for myself, I think it's uh, very important to ask uh, uh, ourselves, how can how young people can contribute to to change within a political climate that's marked by the powerful interests, strong rhetoric, and weak action to climate change? We're still calling for the climate action for the just uh, climate justice, but I think it's still an interest uh, uh, for the police for the authority. There is a weak uh, in terms of political while. Uh, so how young people can contribute to change this? It's a, for us, it's a, a question that as young people, we must ask ourselves. So that's uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you. I will stay here and see if there is uh, some question, we can continue the discussion. Thank you, Rosita. Thank you for listening also. Thank you, Sani. That was a very informative presentation. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, young people in Niger, and it's been amazing, the passion I've seen uh, in engaging in climate action. So. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just a note for the speakers, I will not be interrupting you when you're presenting, um, but just be mindful of time so that we have uh, um, a lot of time for discussion as well left. Um, now, I would like to call um, Shibizi. Um, would you like to take uh, the next round? 
and present. Right, Chibizi, I hope you are online. Right, yes, yes. We will take some time for the um, sound to come up. All right, so thanks for this opportunity. Um, Yeah. Okay, so by, by way of introduction, my name is Chibizi Ezekiel. Um, I am based in Ghana. Uh, so basically to share the youth engagement on climate change issues in Ghana. So I work with a strategic youth network for development, which is basically a youth-oriented NGO that focuses primarily on contributing to the good governance of our natural resource and environmental sector um, through active youth inclusion. Um, we work in four thematic areas, uh, which are climate change, biodiversity, land degradation or forestry, and then renewable energy. The SYND is also the convener for the Youth in Natural Resource and Environmental Governance Platform in Ghana. So the platform basically brings together all youth groups working on different environmental actions where we can learn and share and then embark on joint advocacy in a concerted manner. So basically, um, that's what we do at, um, at SYND. So um, just showing a couple of um, pictures which speaks about the kind of work we do. Um, we have um, on the top left, uh, one of the initial campaigns or initiatives we brought up that part of last year, which is uh, Children for Climate Action. So the idea is to bring young people or children to educate them on climate change and what they can do as children in the fight against climate change. Uh, we've also had some internal consultation among ourselves to see how we can strategize and contribute to national and international work when it comes to climate change. We also do embark on um, demonstrations, street march to call for action, um, so as to um, ensure that the needs of young people are well addressed. Um, the, so re regarding the, the um, in terms of Ghana, um, so this picture basically gives us a fair idea um, in terms of Ghana, how Ghana looks like. Um, I chose this map. Uh, because it gives us some zone, um, because Ghana is made up of usually the, the southern belt, the middle belt, and the northern belt. So um, I live in Accra, which is a coastal savanna, um, and then the middle part is more like the forest areas, and then the northern part, which is more of in a high temperature area. Um, so in terms of population, uh, as of 2018, Ghana, we had a, a little over 28 million people. Um, our official language as a country is English, and our currency is the, is the Ghana cities. In terms of our form of government, it's a democratic form of government. So every four years we go to the pool and then elect our president and our parliamentarians. Um, so in terms of the, the land space, it's 92, a little bit 92,000 square miles. So that is basically a little brief of facts about the country, Ghana. So now let, let me now zero into the climate change adaptation processes in Ghana. So a number of work has had begun um, over the years. Um, as of 2016, we had the national climate change adaptation strategy in place to see how as a country we can implement some interventions to adapt to the impact of the climate change. And then in 2018, um, government also developed what we call the national adaptation plan framework, which was to be a guide or to lead in the actual development of the National Adaptation Plan. So another process began um, two years ago, which, which completed, which ended. Um, so the adaptation process in Ghana has presence in a number of other related interventions or programs. Um, one of them is the NDCs, the Nationally Determined Contributions, which, which has a component of mitigation and adaptation. Um, the goal under, under adaptation basically is to increase climate resilience and then decrease vulnerability for enhanced sustainable development. So that's the main agenda or goal for adaptation when it comes to Ghana's indices. That is a nationally determined contributions. So it's about climate resilience and then to decrease vulnerability. 
again in the NDCs, um, there are 31 program of actions, out of which 11 are uh, adaptation program of actions. And those 11 programs cover um, agri and food security, it covers sustainable forest resource management, it covers resilient infrastructure, it covers climate change and health, it covers water resource, and also gender, and then the vulnerable. So these are the areas that the adaptation program under the NDCs do cover. Now the adaptation also is not in isolation. Um, they work you know, in synergy with the mitigation program of actions as far as our NDCs are concerned. The total budget for, for the NDCs in Ghana is $22.6 billion, out of which um, $17.8 billion are expected you know, when it comes to the cl climate adaptation program of actions. So that is basically how adaptation you know, reflects in our country's NDCs. Beyond the NDCs, we also have our the Sustainable Development Goals, that is the NDCs, uh, sorry, that's the SDGs. So again, in that regard, all government ministries, departments, agencies, and local governance structures are required to inculcate climate change in their development plans. Every year, you know, the sector ministries and the local government structures are required to develop what you call annual progress report. That is demonstrates how they are mainstream climate change in the various, uh, in the various interventions. And so those climate change interventions, there's a number of adaptation interventions that are clearly identified and also implemented. So those are some of the ways by which we are able to show as a country how we are contributing to the achievement of the SDGs, particularly Go 13, which talks about climate action. So I, I just put up this, this photo um, to, to just show a particular case in terms of when it comes to youth involvement uh, in Ghana's climate adaptation agenda. So um, as I mentioned earlier on, this document was developed in October 2018. That's the Ghana's Adaptation Plan Framework. If you look at the right, right side of the photo, um, so under guiding principles, um, I've I tried to highlight a portion which talks about involving youth in climate change adaptation. So this was as a result of our engagement with the state agency that we think that there must be a conscious effort to engage young people when it comes to the climate adaptation program in Ghana. So this document attests to the fact it has made provision for youth inclusion. And for us, we think that that has been a good step you know, to continue the process. So this is now leading into the development of the national adaptation plan. So this is one of the success stories we've, we've engaged, we've, we've come out with you know, as a result of our engagement with the, the sector ministry. Um, so now, the, in terms of the current state of the NAP process, um, somewhere last year, the government of Ghana had approximately $3 million um, grant from the Green Climate Fund, um, its readiness funding, to develop our NAP, our NAP plan, our NAP. So the money has been secured. Um, UNEP is the delivery partner for this particular project. Uh, <clears throat> that is the United Nations Environment Environment Program, and then the state agency responsible, you know, for implementation or the implementing agency, is the Environmental Protection Agency. So, the, in the NAP proposal, um, government in terms of the structure, um, two key structures have been proposed. One is a steering committee, and the two is a four working groups or four working technical groups that must be formed in developing Ghana's NAP. Um, in our last engagement, uh, we were told that nominations for the steering committee have been done already, so they are just awaiting approval uh, for the, those who have been nominated, nominated to serve on the steering committee. Obviously, there will be a CSO rep um, on the steering committee. Beyond that, there will be four other working groups that will be set up you know, to deal with the nitty gritties or to come out with the key issues as far as the NAP is concerned. So in terms of the four working groups, um, so one working group will look at health, the, the second working group will look at uh, water. The third working group will look at infrastructure and land. And the fourth working group will look at energy and agriculture. So those are the four working groups that will be created as part of the NAP process. So, as, so what we are doing now is trying to engage the relevant agency, that is the Environmental Protection Agency, to consciously include young people in all these four working groups so we can have space and contribute to the process. So that is what we mean by you know, youth involvement or participation in the decision-making process. 
The project was supposed to have been launched um, two months ago, but it has to be called off or postponed due to um, COVID-19 outbreak. Yes, so in terms of youth engagement, um, the, we, I just want to share some of the current methods we are, we are using. Um, so what we do is that we engage, you know, uh, the state institutions through consultations that it is important to involve youth uh, in the decision-making process. You know, try to remind them, try to engage them. Um, so that also actually led to youth involvement when it came to the development of the National Climate Change Adaptation Framework. And we, beyond that, we've also consistently, you know, want to stay current, you know, in terms of the situation. So even though um, a lot of activities ended as a result of, a lot of physical activities ended because of COVID-19, we also took the step to organize online meetings, you know, with a state agency, you know, responsible for NAP to get the current situation, what is the status, are there any new development, just to be track the progress so we can also, will not be, you know, fun wanting, you know, and not know what is transparent. So those are some of the methods we use, consistent engagement, you know, to see how we can also contribute and offer our ideas, you know, to the process. That, but beyond that, there are also some general gaps and challenges. One of them is the in terms of when it comes to uh, the space for youth inclusion, um, the space is quite limited. Um, so we, we think that uh, we need more space when it comes to youth, youth involvement and uh, when it comes to uh, decision making process. Usually what happens is that the state box, you know, put together um, CSOs in one group. So as long as there's one or two reps from CSO, they assume that it covers um, all the CSO fraternity, be it women network, be it youth groups and all that. But we think that youth is a very special demographic which must be given a particular space uh, because we don't expect the bigger NGOs to go and speak, you know, really about the concerns of young people. So the youth themselves must also have space in that situation. So there's a limited space when it comes to youth inclusion. And again, one other challenge is, is about the technical capacity uh, to engage meaningfully. And there's a big gap, a big challenge there that we think young people must be given that technical skills, technical ability. So that even when we go to communities and we engage people in the community, we should be able to package our, our message, our story, you know, to become relevant in national reporting processes. So there's a number of, you know, technical gaps that we think that needs to be addressed, you know, as far as youth involvement is concerned. Again, the major challenge has to do with the uh, uh, funding mechanism. And uh, there's no particular funding mechanism when it comes to youth engagement. So that also becomes a major challenge for us. Um, indeed, and at that time that, you know, when it comes to funding opportunity, uh, sometimes even when government is writing a proposal, there's a conscious effort to involve women groups, you know, for them to have their own dialogue and contribute to the process. But we don't see that happening when it comes to young people, you know, usually because there's no budget line for that to, to take place. So that then limits youth participation. So we think that because of that, it has really affected, you know, the way young people must also contribute um, to the process. So these are, for us, I mean, the three top um, gaps and challenges when it comes to youth involvement in national climate, national adaptation process. Uh, our approach in, in resolving these challenges, you know, so far has been to create an organized platform for youth working on environmental actions. In my initial presentation, I mentioned the Youth in Natural Resource an environmental governance platform. So we, we, it's a platform for young people. Um, if we are not getting the funding to mobilize, to build our capacity, we on our own can come together. You know, let's create a platform. Let's learn and share. What can we do among ourselves to contribute to the process? So that is one step we took. And now we are also mobilizing amongst ourselves, you know, as a youth group, you know, when it comes to climate change action, because we need to demonstrate our relevance, you know, to be acknowledged by the state agencies in order to be given the attention that we desire. So again, that is one approach that we are adopting. The third approach has to do with we taking our own initiative, you know, to engage key state agencies. So like I mentioned, even though COVID-19 has stopped a lot of social gatherings and, and all that, we went online to engage a state agency on the NAP, you know, in terms of the current status, so we can understand and appreciate the new development. Beyond that, we also develop some policy papers, uh, policy briefs, you know, by, you know, as to demonstrate, you know, taking such initiative, you know, that at least young people also have what it takes to contribute to the process. So these are some of the initiatives that we've taken um, as a way of resolving um, some of the challenges and gaps that we've identified. Now, what are some of the lessons that we've learned over the period? 
we, we've learned that young people, like other actors, you know, be it uh, youth groups, be it women groups, be it the private sector, be it people with disability, young people also have relevant skills and experience, you know, so there's no doubt about that. So that must be appreciated. Number two, um, young people need support to be organized, you know, that, so that's another lesson we've, we've also had, uh, learned. And then thirdly, also, we think that it is, young people must be given, must be given the necessary capacity building in order to be proactive. So that, that you know, lesson for us is very key. You know, that capacity building component is extremely important for us. Um, so in conclusion, um, we youth inclusion in the NAP process is very essential, essential if we, we talk about sustainability, because it is said that young people are the future leaders. So if that be the case, then it, it makes logical sense that the youth must be engaged today who will be in the helm of affairs in the next 10 or 15 years. So by the time they get in those positions, they'll be well informed with the capacity and ability to continue what their predecessors, predecessors you know, will begin. So I mean, that's one key position or conclusion uh, that we want to drive home. Secondly, um, policy and decision makers need to enforce you know, their own commitment towards youth participation in the decision making process. In Ghana, we have the national youth policy, which has a clear you know, position that young people must be included when it comes to the decision making process. Beyond that, the African Youth Charter also makes that very clear that youth must be involved in the decision making process. In fact, in some international conventions or protocols, it is also acknowledged that young people must be involved in the decision making process. So if all these you know, statements or all these policies or conventions have been, have been agreed and documented, the, the state policies or the state policy actors, you know, actually enhance or enforce the commitments they've made so far when it comes to youth inclusion in the decision making process. So basically, um, this is just um, an overview in terms of how we are engaging in the NAP process in Ghana. Thank you, Vasita, for the opportunity and thank you to the listeners as well. And presentation. I think we can take up questions once we are done with Sajani's presentation as well. Thank you. Sajani, would you like to present now? Um, we have the floor for you. And also, if by any chance I'm missing in action, someone else will take over because there's a bit of shaky internet going on here. Uh, if I'm not around, uh, one, someone from Slack and Trust will take over the question and answer session. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sazani. I hope everyone is doing well, and I also hope uh, you can hear me. So today's topic is about youth engagement and climate change adaptation. And in my presentation, I'll be looking at uh, the Sri Lankan context. Um, so uh, this is the structure of my presentation. I'll first look at uh, the work that Slyke and Trust does and my role at Slyke and Trust and also an overview um, in, uh, of Sri Lanka and then climate change adaptation processes, youth engagement in Sri Lanka, some of the gaps, challenges and lessons learned and then I'll be giving my final remarks in the conclusion. So Slyke and Trust works to contribute to collective local and global efforts to address impacts of climate change, animal welfare, as well as social and economic issues hindering social justice. I work as a research and program officer, so I mainly uh, deal with coordination and research work. I have a background in law and in international relations. So moving on to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is a developing tropical island nation in the Indian Ocean, and uh, it is vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So throughout the past several years, we have experienced floods, droughts, landslides, and sea level rise. And this is not just in terms of one sector, but all sectors are impacted um, from climate change impacts. And at the same time, it impacts lives, livelihoods, and uh, ecosystems and biodiversity. 
So moving on to the population of Sri Lanka, we have a population of around 21.7 million people and out of which 23% of the population are youth. So when Sri Lanka determines who falls under youth, uh, the age range is those falling between the ages of 15 uh, to 29 years. Um, also looking at youth unemployment rate in the year 2017, the youth unemployment rate was at 18.5%. Uh, so when we look at this, what we do see is that Sri Lanka is in fact vulnerable to climate change impacts which makes adaptation measures and adaptation actions uh, important than ever. So moving uh, towards the climate change adaptation processes in Sri Lanka. So we do have a national adaptation plan. It covers adapt adaptation needs at two levels. One is the adaptation needs of 90 vulnerable sectors and uh, also the cross-cutting national needs of adaptation. So we also have two projects that have been funded by Green Climate Fund. Uh, the first one is strengthening climate resilience of subsistence farmers and agricultural plantation communities. So uh, this takes place um, in the Knuckles Mountain range. And what it um, does is that it tries to build the adaptive capacity of subsistence farmers so they can address the impacts of climate-induced uh, water and irrigation shortages. So the second um, project is strengthening the resi resilience of smallholder dry zone farmers through integrated uh, water management. Again, this also tries to improve the resilience of smallholder farmers uh, so as to address um, temperature uh, rise as well as other uh, extreme weather events. So what this does is it actually helps um, to adapt uh, to actually for communities as well as individuals to adapt uh, to climate change uh, impacts. So we also have the third national communication, which is a comprehensive report on the nation's climate change related information gathered by government entities, experts and consultants across nine sectors. Um, so these nine sectors closely align with our nationally uh, determined contributions. Um, and Slyke and Trust is one of the partners of the TNC Consortium. So under this, uh, uh, we have conducted several stakeholder consultations, out of which two are youth uh, consultations. So um, that basically shows that uh, the communication strategy does have um, an input that uh, came from youth as well. Uh, apart from this, uh, this process also um, has given um, grants uh, to young researchers and at the same time it does encourage uh, youth to engage in climate research as well. So moving on to youth engagement um, in Sri Lanka. So we have a youth forum on climate change during the Sri Lanka Next Blue Green Era, and we engage with youth through capacity building and project proposals. So um, in this uh, context, Life and Trust uh, makes a nationwide call uh, for project proposals, and uh, then we do um, select uh, the best projects, and either we fund uh, the projects or we um, engage with uh, the youth participants uh, by aligning their interests and uh, with our existing projects or even uh, future projects as well. So that's one way in which Slyke and Trust engages with youth uh, in Sri Lanka. We also have a Blue Green Protectors Program, uh, which is actually for mangrove restoration. And uh, we also um, have stakeholder. It's also a very participatory and multi-stakeholder driven initiative. So we do work with uh, government uh, entities, responsible government entities, but at the same time, we also engage with uh, youth uh, as well. Um, so uh, just to give an example, um, uh, during the Jaffna restoration um, site, uh, we actually engaged with uh, the university uh, students of the Jaffna University. Uh, so we have understood and we do engage at ground level uh, with uh, our youth when it comes to our projects um, as well. So we also create awareness through knowledge products as well. Um, you could, uh, we have provided a platform uh, in our website where 
um, there are a lot of uh, information about climate change activities uh, as well as um, climate um, change related um, issues. So um, another way is that it's not only uh, creating awareness through these knowledge projects, but also uh, we, uh, we uh, get the assistance of um, the youth as well. For example, I've been a part of Slyke and Trust, um, and I've also contributed as a research assistant, uh, assistant to some of these um, research work as well. So moving on to gaps and challenges that we face when engaging with youth. Um, one thing is there's a lack of information on different activities uh, related to climate change action and uh, capacity needs uh, exist. And also there's an absence of climate change education in the school system. Uh, again, um, as I mentioned earlier, something that was focused on um, during the third national, uh, third communication uh, was uh, encouraging youth uh, to participate in climate related uh, research. So lack of youth led research is also something uh, that we face uh, when in engaging um, some of the gaps that we have found in relation to um, youth engagement in Sri Lanka. Um, and that's something that needs to be uh, promoted as well. Um, so some of the lessons that we have learned uh, is that sustaining the interest of those who have gone through capacity building to continue in climate change related work uh, and also um, the need for local language based capacity building because um, we do have uh, different communities speaking different languages. We have Sinhala, Tamil, and also English um, speaking communities. And uh, we also found that individual uh, led projects are more effective than those based on group engagement. Uh, this is something we observed during uh, certain group works that we did at uh, the youth forum and also um, the decision making process needs to officially integrate uh, youth engagement um, as well. So moving on uh, to uh, some of um, my fi our final remarks or what we have uh, found is that uh, there is a strong need to include youth as a key stakeholder in NDC and NAP activities. And also, as I mentioned earlier, one of the gaps was that we don't have climate change education uh, in our education system, so, um, and also the capacity need. So education and capacity building is a key component if we do, need, uh, if we do want effective youth engagement, and uh, also climate finance for empowering youth uh, in climate action uh, is also uh, something that we need. So um, that is the conclusion uh, of my presentation. Um, thank you everyone for listening and uh, uh, over to you, Ms. Wasika. Um, for the information and the presentation, just to clarify, um, I think we need to explain what national communications are for those who might be new to the process. It's a reporting um, process by the government but in Sri Lanka, this process was driven by different stakeholders engaging where youth were brought in as part of the climate change strategy that was developed, as well as some of the grants that were given to research. I think uh, some of the selective panel uh, for that were, is on the call today as well, so maybe he can give more information on it. And we also forgot to mention that the NDCs have uh, uh, adaptation component. So um, thank you very much, uh, all the presenters. Now we, now we would, um, okay. I think there's a question coming in, which um, which is already there about the group-based and individual-led projects. Um, we might have to clarify what was on the presentation um, on that front, um, Sajani. That might that that would be something for you. But let's open the floor for questions, and then um, you can ask clarifying questions. You can ask any other question, but stick to the focus of the webinar when we ask questions. Um, now we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, 
why individual-led projects were more successful than group-based ones. Would you like to take it? I think it's from directly from your presentation. And you might have to explain about how this was applied to youth forum and not necessarily overall projects. Um, so basically to address the first part of your question um, about how youth had gone through capacity building process were engaged on an ongoing basis even uh, for example uh, during the youth forum there were a lot of participants who were interested in mangrove restoration projects so then we engaged them uh, in one of our Kalpitiya restoration projects and at the same time uh, at present we do have a colleague uh, who was a participant at, at the youth conference, um, who uh, was a technic, uh, who had an interest in insurance resilience, and now he is working uh, with us uh, in an insurance resilience based project that we are doing. Uh, with uh, regard to individual uh, led projects and group based, it's uh, more about uh, delivery and it was uh, more uh, about the way it was structured in terms of uh, working together sometimes. Um, the ideas that come out were uh, a bit uh, not clear cut um, in terms of projects, but this was purely based on uh, project proposals and um, uh, and it was um, it's not a generalization. In fact, uh, if uh, uh, they went through a proper capacity building process, uh, maybe the situation uh, would be different. This is at the starting point of the youth um, conference um, that uh, this observation was made. So hope that was um, hope that answered your question. Thank you. On the youth group um, component, uh, since we are part of developing this, it was a progress. So initially, when the youth forum started, it was through groups that we want to implement projects. But the interest levels of the partners were different. So there, when it was given to one individual to bring everything together and deliver, there was more performance than having the group responsible equally. So that's what was the experience, not that the groups did not deliver per se, but the levels of interest were different of individuals and the engagement and the capacity to deliver. Yeah, let's go to the next one. Um, that's the Sunny. Sunny, would you like to take it? It's about the STG localization uh, in Niger. Absolutely. This is a, a, a good question because, you know, Lina, uh, Niger already presents his uh, national review in 2018. And this year also we are in the process uh, uh, to present. Normally, Niger must present his uh, second report on the SDGs implementation. But uh, really, uh, we have like here several network uh, uh, for youth organization that try to address uh, the SDGs. But the main issue for me is at the ground, the community level. At this point, there is a, there is a, a gap because uh, how we can adapt the SDG to the community or how some activities of young people, youth organization are taken in account as uh, activities that address SDGs. So really there is, a, I was part, I, I actually am part of uh, the committee that review uh, that elaborate, uh, elaborate the report, but there is no like specific indicator uh, for youth organization or youth involvement in this process. Uh, we have like a kind of, we have like a specific meeting with uh, youth leaders to hear from them uh, or in terms of their activities, if they have like some key activity and indicator that we can take in consideration to some relevant SDGs. But as now, we just have like a kind of template that will share to youth leaders or some youth organization that they have to uh, send feedback. So really, it, it's a good question, but uh, it, it's, it's still a challenge for us here to have like a kind of key indicator or target. People know that youth organization try to deal with, but they don't know exactly how to capitalize it. Thank you. Maybe someone at. Sunny Uncle. Okay, this question for what measure have you taken to monitor in non plan after its implementation? 
climate change mitigation and community based. Yes, maybe I can go to the next, this question. So it's for me. What measures have you taken to monitor your plan after it is implemented to climate change mitigation community base? Actually, how we can do is like our activities are driven by the community. So when we have like a kind of mitigation adaptation program to of uh, in, in a community, we try to involve them really and to have like some focal point and some ambassador in the community. So we do those, uh, those one. After the project, we have like some periodically, we have to, we can go to see how the activity, the impact in long term. And also we have like a kind of a report that we receive to see how the activities, how the project is going after uh, the implementation. So uh, I think it's good to have like a real uh, connection with the community uh, and at the community level to try to involve them to let them be part of the process because not they don't uh, we don't uh, we consider them as partner not only as uh, implementer of our activities but when we start a project in the beginning during the reflection the elaboration we try to discuss with them and taking account our their interest and then when it's come to the implementation we implement with them and after we let them continue the project because in terms of sustainability we have to be sure that after uh, the implementation project, the community can continue doing the good practice. Uh, that's why some uh, we have like uh, last year we launched a, a, a cooking book in, on uh, with good practice in terms of uh, disaster risk management. So we try to have like a, a database uh, for our good practice that we have with the community. So we consider community as partner. And after the implementation, we still work with them to receive their feedback. And we try also to mobilize other funds in order to allow them to continue the project. Um, I will have to make an intervention here because we are having a lot of questions on mitigation, but we are trying to discuss on climate change adaptation and the NAP process. So I, I would be taking the prerogative to um, take out some of these questions because we have only a limited amount of time. And I don't, if it doesn't connect with your youth engagement, we'll take it up later. So I'm going to skip this question on clean development mechanisms. But I think Dr. Sukhadapala on the call would be able to answer that question. Um, Okay, second question, I would like to comment on off-percentism. What are the most important skills that you have to improve uh, in training with regards to capacity building? How do you plan to make your program sustainable? Shibizi, would you like to take that question? Chibisi, Sunny, Sajani, anyone who can open their mics? Uh, it's taking some time for the mic to open, so. Right, okay. Chibisi is on. Okay, right. Yes. Maybe take that yes. question. So, yes, uh, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, I mean, this is a very relevant question. Uh, but in, in answering this question, I want to give uh, a scenario. Um, as part of Ghana's uh, report to um, the updated version of the NDCs. The government agency responsible for development report actually met with civil society and said that they want to now make a provision in the report and dedicate one chapter for CSOs to write our own report. Because over the years, what it is, the government will put together a draft report and then expect CSOs to make comments, input, and contribution. But now they are giving us the chance to write our own you know, present our own information to be part of the report to be submitted to, to the UNFCCC. One, I mean, that's a very laudable opportunity, but the question now comes to us, do we have the skills and the ability to write and contribute to set technical reports? So, so that is where, I mean, if you ask me uh, the challenges, I mean, the, the ability to package our interventions, our advocacy work at a local level and make it meaningful, you know, to the national reporting process. 
that is for me where the, the biggest challenge is because if you look at the local level interventions i mean all over the world we see young people actively involved some using their time energy and own resources but usually those activities are not reported are not captured you know so it's about how do we innovatively you know put these things together and make it meaningful in the national reporting process so for me i think that that is the the capacity building that that we need um to the as young people whatever we write what we present becomes meaningful you know to the discussion but i'm happy to announce that uh, in ghana we are engaging epa and epa has agreed in fact we're actually working on the timelines prior to the covid 19 outbreak they they are actually going to train young people on how to calculate emissions, how to, you know, do all those technical work, you know, as a youth group working on climate change so that we can understand and appreciate the issue. It was, it's supposed to be a 10 day training program for us as young people, you know, so we can also build our skills and make meaningful contribution. But of course that didn't happen because of the COVID-19. So, I mean, so if you ask me, those are the skills. As long as we have the skills and ability, then, you know, that has a cascading effect as, lo as, lo as long as, um, sustainability is concerned. So that is my, my take on this. Time and we've already arrived over time. Um, what's the next question? Okay. Um, that's about accessing finance. Maybe you could term it differently and uh, take the question, maybe Sunny, how how you guys as an organization brought in or access funding to do your youth related work. Maybe that could be something we could answer. Um, Sunny or BC. I think there are a few questions for Sajani very specifically uh, later. So maybe you guys can answer this question. Yes, uh, maybe I can add uh, in our side, like if we have a kind of uh, project or activity that's a proposal for climate change action if you don't have fun uh, for me is to see how we can have like a partnership with uh, the government agencies or for un agencies. you have several un agencies that have like a specific program or some small grants so sometimes you have to apply to small grant and then if your your project uh, is uh, aligned with their uh, main objective it's possible uh, for them to finance you. And also you have to show interest. Sometimes when we start, you have to start with the strategy, no money action, to show your commitment also. that's uh, You can't start just by organizing a project and ask for fun. But when you start by doing action in uh, the, the field, so it's easy for the partner, for the government also to see that you're already active and it's easy for them to finance you. But you have to look at uh, UN agencies or some you know, diplomatic uh, like consular. They have every year, they have like some grant. They have a call for proposal so you can apply. You have just to go and read carefully and see if uh, the project are uh, in the same field and then it's uh, possible to be financed by those organizations. But the first thing is to try to have like a kind of partnership with the government and then if they have like partners also uh, that want to work with the civil society or with the community-based organization, they can uh, let you know or to be, if you are listed in their database, this is another action. So you are first, you have to go and register yourself to be sure that you are, you are among the actors in this field. So this is uh, what I can add. Okay, I think she busy missed the question, but just to add on what um, Sunny said, uh, it's very important actually, it's, it's true that uh, we need to be, as you, if you're a youth uh, entity, to recognize yourself as a com com committed um, organization or an individual working on the issue so that you can be taken seriously and engaged as a partner in the process. Um, next question is for whom? Uh, okay, a uh, small group of 14 only. Okay, so this question, I think uh, we can take on separately, uh, Aditya, and uh, and then see how we could collaborate and work. I think Sajani would be very happy to give you detailed information on this. Um, let's go to the next question. Uh, I 
I think we also answered this question uh, when Sunny um, uh, gave input on how we, we could access uh, climate finance. Um, unless Chebisi and Sajani wants to add a bit more, um, we can go to the next question as well. So the key things in his answer was that you have to be recognized, you need to be committed, you need to reach out to the government agencies, uh, check in for grants that are available to UN and other entities. Um, I'm just summarizing what Sunny said. Um, okay, next question. Sajani, would you like to take this? So when we do projects, uh, one uh, part of our projects is to create awareness. Um, so we also have awareness programs where we do um, um, engage with uh, uh, the locals and do share uh, knowledge about the importance of mangroves and um, uh, the importance it has to um, the environment as well as economic activities. So we try to educate them and to show them uh, the importance of it so uh, it becomes uh, far more um, easy to engage with them once uh, they're given that uh, knowledge. So, thank you. Give a bit more detail information on this as well because Tatcha works on this pro uh, project uh, very closely with the community. So maybe you can add a bit more information on it. Okay, next question. Okay, um, who would like to take this uh, question? Sunny, GBC? Maybe GBC if you're around, because Sunny asked a lot of questions. Oh, uh, uh, maybe I can say uh, throughout there is a lot of, uh, uh, in terms of network on youth, you have uh, the IEC, uh, IEC Africa Youth Initiative on Climate Change that have a website and uh, uh, Facebook page also. On social media, you can find a, a lot of network uh, on the relevant topic in terms of climate change. You just have to put in uh, Google or on, throughout the social media, uh, the uh, like uh, climate change adaptation or use and get, and you can find like a useful link for me it's like uh, just to go through off like the network because there's a lot of network uh, with uh, young people uh, in africa or globally that try to share knowledge to share uh, to stay together make campaign all those things so go through off uh, some website or through off uh, uh, social media you can find a lot of that you can join. You have the CAN also, the Climate Action Network. I think it's a, a good platform also in terms of uh, data or in terms of uh, knowledge sharing. Thank you, Sunny. Uh, Chibisi, would you like to add? Yes, um, just a quick one to what Sunny shared. Um, so like Sunny said, we have the AIC, um, African Youth Initiative on Climate Change. We also have the major groups on children and youth that is uh, at a global level. So, so those are the platforms you can engage to get all the knowledge and information. And the good thing is that um, sometimes within these regional groups, which are AIC and a global group like the major groups, children and youth, they do create some working groups or technical groups among young people to handle specific issues. So yes, those global platforms do exist. Thank you. And also um, you could um, join the youth NGO group of the NFCCC process where you have a lot of global um, youth working, Global South Youth working, um, I'm sure it's open to everyone to join. Um, and that would be a useful platform to be on as well. Um, we can take maybe one or two more questions because uh, we can extend to one and a half hours the discussion. Um, so um, if you have the next one. Okay, um, we're going to skip this as well because it's about food security. Uh, next one. Right. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, question to maybe Sajani could, uh, maybe we can close the questions with this. Um, all three of you can answer and then we will reach out to the speakers with the questions that are remaining and we'll uh, send you answers to which are relevant to the webinar's topic. 
Uh, Saljani, would you like to start with the other two also maybe providing input? So the question is how the lifestyle changes um, and technology could impact or help the climate adaptation actions. I think Sunny mentioned this in his presentation also. And then also strategic interventions to improve the situation. Tajani? Um, yeah. Uh, um, um, so one thing is obviously technological advancement. Uh, we can um, use it uh, to create awareness or like um, in terms of I'm, I'm talking in terms of um, social media platforms and things like that. We can um, sort of uh, create awareness um, and bring in youth engagement more to climate uh, adaptation actions because um, even through, uh, if it's Twitter, Instagram, uh, uh, we can uh, actually um, include uh, youth engagement uh, through um, those platforms. And uh, Uh, lifestyle changes and lifestyle changes affecting us. So, actually, I'm having difficulty understanding the question. Uh, if uh, the other two speakers can actually take over, um, so Sunny or Tabizi, if you could take over the question, uh, it would be great. Thank you. Uh, uh, uh. Can, can you hear me? Okay, good, good, good. So, um, so I, I think that uh, um, Sajina has actually dealt with the um, the technology part. Uh, in terms of lifestyle changes, um, it, it's quite a very broad um, issue. Um, but just to give, it's about how do we take advantage of some of these changes um, in terms of climate change adaptation actions and what are the strategy interventions to improve the situation. Um, so, I mean, for example, I mean, we all do attest that the current COVID-19 pandemic has actually changed our lifestyle, you know, but that doesn't mean that we, sh we should stop working, we should stop pursuing our agenda. So in the midst of that lifestyle change, I mean, how do we ensure that we engage um, more youth engage more on climate adaptation actions and what are the strategies that we can adopt. So it, it, it's, it's, it's about how to balance the situation. So from our side, COVID-19 has stopped physical meetings. We all know that when it comes to NGO work or CSO work, we do more of workshops, more of conferences, engage, go to a community level. Now we are talking about physical distancing and, you know, and all that. So that is a limit. Lifestyle has changed, but how do we adapt? You know, so it's all part of the adaptation process. So I think that it brings to bear the need to use technology, which uh, Sajani has mentioned. Now we are doing more of webinar, uh, we are doing more of online discussions, online meetings to continue the advocacy, to create more awareness on climate change adaptation. So I think that the strategies, you know, how is moving our activities from the ground into space. So when I say space, I'm talking about you know online platform. So for me, that's a strategy that we can adopt uh, to continue pursuing our climate change uh, adaptation, at least within the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, when the pandemic is over, uh, we can still continue our work and still use technology. I must also admit that uh, when it comes to technology, most of us are young people, you know, it's a youth who are continuing technology. So it's, it's more to our advantage to use our platforms to push our agenda and to demand for more climate action. So basically, there is a little bit I want to share to what Sajani has also said. Thank you. Sunny, would you like to add anything? Or maybe an example of how you use social media and technology to engage uh, youth in Niger? Because I know you have a large following online. Yes, uh, you know, uh, as every continent in West Africa, young people are more uh, try to follow uh, the, the uh, social media. So for us, it's uh, 
we, I think it is very important to, to adapt in terms of innovative way. That, that's here we have like a kind of boot camp. The boot camp try to have like a solution for young people uh, in terms of uh, climate change action, in terms of uh, how we can have a link with other young people that live in rural area or in, or in other region, or how young people, uh, when you participate in another conference, how we can be sure that your maybe constituency here locally can also follow you. So I think it, it, uh, the strategy is to have like, uh, to have a deeply present in, in, on social media. Sometimes you can have also, you can boost your, your uh, uh, Facebook page to have more followers. But if you still have put some content, it's sure that you can have at the end a lot of people that can try to follow you. But it's important also to deal with the technology. And uh, actually, young people are the ones that lead technology. So it's good to put our all our action to see also how we can have a uh, technology, the digital issue on this. So that's why actually, uh, due to the COVID-19, we launched uh, several digital campaigns in order to share uh, the good practice, in order to share the useful information about the DC. So I think it, it could be the same in other topics. So today we have like the capacity to launch some uh, online conferences on, uh, to share our practice, the good practice throughout the community at the community level. So, so for me, youth, uh, youth engagement is not only in terms of action, uh, on the ground, but it's also how we share uh, what we do and uh, our knowledge to other uh, young people that are not near, so they can have benefit uh, to all these experiences, of the best practices. Okay, thank you, Sunny. I think Sajani wants to add a bit more uh, to her answer. I'm passing the mic to her now. One minute, please. I apologize because initially I couldn't understand the question. So uh, moving to uh, the lifestyle changes, as you know now, uh, veganism as well as um, um, sustainable uh, lifestyles are being promoted. It has become a trend among the youth. Uh, we see a lot of people encouraging uh, vegan-based um, uh, uh, food uh, uh, styles and food uh, lifestyles. And at the same time, uh, recently, um, I saw in some uh, Instagram um, platforms, we see uh, people asking for, um, uh, for example, just to give an example, uh, sometimes reusable shampoo bottles. They don't want uh, more products like that. They want uh, um, sort of shops where they can use the same bottle and go and refill it. So uh, it's far more um, sustainable and it doesn't have an impact. Um, on uh, uh, the climate, uh, the environment as well, and helping in the process as well. If you look at uh, what Slide and Trust is doing, also we are promoting uh, Meatless Mondays. We have a project called Meatless Monday, and we also uh, do um, interviews um, uh, with restaurants and small cafes that promote um, vegan uh, menus as well. So that's um, some way uh, a way that uh, lifestyle changes can help in. Uh, the climate uh, adaptation actions as well. So I think uh, using both together, using technology advancements and uh, promoting that uh, way of sustainable lifestyle is one way in which we, uh, as a young generation, can help um, the climate adaptation action as well. Because I believe those two go hand in hand um, in promoting uh, climate adaptation action. So thank you. everyone for joining us today. A big thank you to the speakers uh, and everyone who waited 30 minutes extra so that we can answer our questions. Um, we will be having uh, different webinars, technical capacity building sessions targeting youth. And we are also working on uh, a knowledge product that would um, encourage youth engagement in NDCs and especially in NAP process to identify the needs and how um, youth could be facilitated or encouraged and um, and how you can advocate for the inclusion of youth in decision-making processes. So your inputs are very valuable in this. Um, I'm grateful that everyone was staying until the webinar was over and we hope to have you again on another webinar. Thank you very much and bye from us now. Have a nice evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Bye. <laughs>